is a little bit different. It's set on the Tasmanian coast, um, which is uh, different to a lot of the backgrounds that she's looked at before. Um, it centers around a main character named Kieran. Uh, I'm gonna get Jane to explain to you uh, the premise, the synopsis a little bit, but before we do, there are three things that we need from you. The first is that there is a link to the book in the comments. So if you don't have your book yet, grab it online at Dimix, or you can go in store and grab it. The second thing is that we will be taking questions in the second half. So please leave your questions in the comments and um, we will be getting to them. And the third thing, perhaps the most important, is no spoilers. So you're not allowed to put in the comments that you know how it ends because everyone knows that the best part of a Jane Harper novel is up in the middle of the night trying to get to the end because you have no idea what's about to happen. So they are the three things you need to know. Jane, welcome. Hi, Jessie. Thanks, um, thanks for doing this. It's great to talk to you again. Yes, you too. Now, I wanted to ask you first, um, I've given a little synopsis. It's set in Tasmania. It is a murder crime mystery. Can you tell us in your own words what the book is about for anyone who doesn't know yet? Yeah, sure. So The Survivors is, um, like my other books, is another Australian mystery. Um, like I said, this time is set along um, the Tasmanian coast in a, a really small um, community. So um, there's lots of you know, small town intrigue and secrets to be uncovered. And it centres around the main character who's a, um, a guy called Kieran Elliott who's 30 years old. He has a, a young family of his own. Um, he grew up in this small town um, and he returns there um, for a visit to help his parents for various reasons. And he's barely arrived when a body is found on the beach. And why Tasmania? Because the others, you kind of focus a lot on the Australian landscape, particularly the dry and, and the lost man was about sort of drought, really hot, um, the danger inherent in, in the Australian landscape. Why did you choose Tasmania for this book? Yeah, I mean, the settings are really important to me. Um, you know, when I'm thinking about the book, um, the plot is kind of the first thing I'm starting to think about, but immediately I start to think about the settings. And um, those were really interlinked. And um, I had this idea for The Survivors, which was this kind of real kind of coastal mystery. Um, and I wanted somewhere that had that really kind of rugged, you know, kind of seascape and this small, this sort of small town feel. Um, and, you know, Tasmania just ticked all those boxes. You know, it was a really, I think once I kind of decided that was what the plot was going to be centered around, that was a really obvious choice. Um, for lots of reasons. And, um, you know, I always I always sort of spend a lot of time thinking about settings because I like the setting to be more than just the backdrop. I think, you know, it's a bit of a shame when it just is, is a bit like a theatre set. You know, I, I prefer it when um, I can, you know, have a setting that really drives the action and it kind of, um, you know, it, it sort of informs the plot. So things happen in that setting that couldn't happen in another setting, it, it kind of makes the characters what they are in a lot of ways. So they've maybe grown up in this place or you know, they've moved to this place and it's sort of, you know, it formed them as adults um, in a lot of ways. So, um, you know, I like it ideally that the reader will get to the end of the book and they look back and think, you know, yeah, that, that story couldn't have been set anywhere else. And you actually went to Tasmania, didn't you, for research? Yeah, yeah, I did. So I, I always, um, like I always, do sort of go on a research trip um, and I've been to Tasmania like a few times before for um, like this for holidays and I've been you know for the book and things um, yeah just for sort of my own interest really but um, I always like to do a kind of a specific research trip um, so I went um, so I did that this time and I was actually really lucky because I went um, in February this year because um, I kind of want to go again around the time when the book set so the survivors said and I kind of you know, tail end of summer when the tourists are kind of scattering and it's sort of the locals who are left behind really. Um, and so I, I went to it's at the end of Feb and um, kind of just sort of squeaked in, I think, before, you know, we all got sent into lockdown. So I was pretty, I was pretty happy, like my timing sort of worked out really well. Um, but it was really fascinating. I went, um, I have two young children, so we, we all went this time. I, I normally go alone, but we, we all went. Um, drove down the coast, um, stopped at a lot of these kind of small 
towns that are, you know, sort of helped kind of inspire, I guess, the um, Evelyn Bay, which is the town in the book. Um, I went, um, I went scuba diving, which was um, kind of, it was a really, really amazing experience. I mean, I'm not a diver, but I had a, a diving element in the book and I, I felt it was something I needed to experience firsthand. So I sort of arranged to, um, to do that and, and get a feel for, you know, what that was like in those kind of waters and, you know, the kind of the safety aspects they tell you about and um, what kind of things you see and, and that, you know, all that sort of stuff that I think helps really write those kind of scenes. Um, that scene was was perfect in, in the book. You felt like you were underwater with them. And, and I think you're right. You couldn't have got that quite perfect if you'd not dived yourself. That's right. And I think those things are always really good to do you know, if you can because, um, you know, you, it, it is different from, um, you know, just, I don't know, watching a video or, or even interviewing someone. Like, I, you know, I interview, like, a lot of people as well about things that I don't maybe know about firsthand. So, um you know, so I mean, for example, I mean, so for example, in the book, there's a lot of um, touched a bit on the, the themes of kind of grief and guilt, and and so I spoke to um, I spoke to someone from Beyond Blue um, about that quite extensively, about that that kind of impact on on you know young men especially, but um, but in terms of the physical things like yeah, the, the scenery and yeah, being in the water and and yeah, the diving and things. I think that's something that it really it really can add something to the writing if you can do it yourself. Are you thinking that your next book should be in the Amalfi Coast, maybe Tuscany? <laughs> I think that would be a good setting. <laughs> you know, I think that I, I do. I think that quite a lot. I remember um, when I wrote The Lost Man, and I was out in, you know, in, in outback Queensland, and that was in February as well. That was that was pretty hot. And thinking, you know, I should just, you know, I should set one of these books in like Vegas or something. It's, <laughs> <laughs> the world is wide open. <laughs> exactly. It's just all research, like. <laughs> You've got to do your research. Are there any, I always wonder with your books and particularly with this one, if there was a new story that inspired the idea, because the idea is so specific and so compelling and there are so many elements to it, where does the idea come from? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting question because um, by the time I finished the book, it's actually quite hard for me some times to think back to you know, the start because I think writing a book is such a layered process and and it you know you go through so many kind of stages of it and it, it develops so much over the course of, of 90,000 words and multiple drafts that um, you know you feel there should be this sort of moment where you say okay yeah, I had I had the idea and it was about this and it all kind of came from you know, it all kind of came together from there, but it, it doesn't. It doesn't really do that for me. So, I mean, often I'll sort of start with something really small, and um, you know, I've sort of said before, um, you know, in interviews and things. But I, I often, when I'm thinking about what I might like to write about, I'm I'm thinking more heavily about the end. Um, so I don't kind of start it with a, an opening because I think an opening is um, well and good, but you have to know where it's. You know where it's going to go. The opening has to sort of deliver the the rest of the book. So I always try and start um, a little bit from the end, and think about what's that kind of conclusion that I want the reader to to come to. You know, what what events have have we got here? And then from there, I'm sort of thinking, okay, so you know, you've got this you've got this event that sort of happened, and and how has it happened? Like, who? What has sort of driven? You know these people to the situation you know what 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 has sort of forced them to act in maybe an extreme way or out of character or you know commit violence against each other and what um has happened in their lives or in their immediate recent past or you know in in their upbringing or whatever to kind of bring them to this moment and that's where you started to kind of build the characters around it and then um and then I'm starting to think, you know, so, okay, so where do you sort of drop the reader into this story then? Like, what, do, where do you drop them in so they have the information they need to know? Um, and, you know, kind of you can build the world enough to, to draw them into this, this story and bring them to this end point. So that's kind of how I'm kind of building it. And so you do know the last page when you write the first page. You know exactly where you're going. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't know... Um, 
like yeah i always know the ending like the sort of i guess how that ending is going to play out is all is always a bit fluid in the planning for me um so um I, I sort of I know um, all yeah I absolutely know the the ending. Um, I guess how you execute that ending is what I would work on, you know, during the planning and during the, the drafting and things. Um, because I think you can have um, an idea for a scene or you know um, a character, um, you know, or kind of a conversation, and you know you can execute that same scene in a lot of different ways. Yeah, and that's the sort of creative process starts coming in you want to execute every every part of the book and every scene in the best possible way you can for the reader and I'm interested as well I think we've um talked about this before in relation to the dry and the lost man you write men really really well there is something the complexity that you bring to those characters and the inner worlds are, are just pretty incredible why do you think you write men so well? And why is that, um, you know, what, what you're drawn to with Kieran and, you know, two of your other books? Why, why do you think that male protagonists are, you know, a real strength of yours? You know, I always try and um, I think the first thing I always think about is I always think um, you've got to find the best characters to tell the story, whoever that's going to be. Because I do think I do think about it a lot, like particularly like lately because, you know, I have a daughter and I have a son and I've got four books with male protagonists. And I and I wonder, you know, I do sort of think, you know, what would when my children are old enough to read the books, you know, when my yeah, you know, my daughter asked me that question, what's um what's the answer I give her? And I think I need to be, feel comfortable with that answer. And I, and I do feel comfortable with it because um I think for me in every um in every book so far, um the the there's there's been sort of um I guess, you know, um plot and technical reasons why it's better for me to have a male character. So, um, for example, those reasons could include um, the, uh, you know, I guess relationships within the book, um, sort of geographical um, consistency. So I suppose like in The Lost Man is a good example of that where, you know, when I went out there and was sort of speaking to people who were um, working on these remote castle stations, um, the, the makeup of the households were, there was quite a typical makeup of a household, which I think was important to reflect that rather than create maybe a, an artificial one for the sake of it. Um, I think it's important as well to have a, a main character who has a bit of a, um, enough of an overview, I think, that you take the read away you need to with the main character. And so, for example, um, in Survivors, I think it, it helped me in a lot of ways having a male character um, as a main character because he um, was able to do things that I think, um, you know, maybe a, um, you know, a woman in that situation wouldn't do. So, for example, there's conversations within the community when this, um, when this body is found on the beach, um, his partner is reluctant, his partner is reluctant to go on the beach because she doesn't feel safe, whereas he has no problem with it. He just walks around town, he's fine. And I think that is an accurate reflection of people's reaction. So things like that are, are kind of all things that, that come into it when I'm deciding who is it's gonna tell this story. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm interested, obviously with The Dry, that was your first New York Times bestselling book, um, awards made into a film. What's it like having such enormous success and then going on, you've written this is your third book since then, do you feel pressure to live up to that, you know, incredible success? And if so, how do you deal with that pressure? Is there a new experience of sitting down to write and there's a weight on your shoulders that didn't exist before? Um, you know, it is like a different experience, obviously, you know, with every book, I think particularly from, you know, your debut and, um, you know, I, I mean, as you would know, I know your, your debut novel is coming out next year, you know, and I think when you're writing your debut, you know, you do have this sort of, I think, sense of freedom in that nobody really knows what you're up to and there's, there's not that kind, there's not really that expectation, you know, you just have to kind of um, deliver, deliver something, you know, that, that's kind of, um, and whether people care or not is kind of the only question, I guess. And and so, 
there is, you know, it is a different experience than when, you know, you know, people start, do start to get to know your work and I guess they have, um, you know, they have like um, that, that kind of knowledge, I suppose, um, mm -hmm. and they're looking out for it. But it's funny because I think also you sort of, um, for me, I think especially, you know, um, lately, like it's, it's sort of turned another corner again where it, it's sort of, I feel in a lot of ways I've kind of achieved what I ever had set out to achieve, you know, yeah. um, with the book. So I, I wanted to write a book and I did it and I hoped it would get published and it was. And the success I've had has been far beyond anything that I, I ever would have imagined, you know, for my work. And, you know, I, I don't really have any, um, um, I don't have to write anymore. You know, I mean, yeah. like I, I, I've, I've done, I've achieved what I really wanted to achieve with it. And so now the only reason for me to continue writing is because I enjoy it. So, and I do enjoy it. You know, I enjoy sitting down there and, you know, kind of getting to kind of create these stories and um, making it exactly how I want it to be. And and for me, that that's that's enough now. And that's all I really am, am, am doing, you know, um, that's, what, that's what really drives me now, I think. Does it get easier? Like, you know, you've, you've done this a few times now and, and you've done a TED Talk on plotting out a novel and breaking it down into these incredible steps of how it's done. You've almost created, you know, an art or a science around how to write a book. You've interrogated that process. You've done it four times. By the fourth time, does it feel like it comes more easily or are you still having those conflicts that every writer has? Um, do you know, I think it does get easier, actually. Like, so if everybody's um, uh, they're kind of struggling with their, their you know, debut unpublished novel, um, I, like, I honestly do think it does get easier because I think, you know, you, you get to know um, all these shortcuts that work work for, for you. Um, so you can, you, you kind of get to know your own rhythm and what sort of helps you get to work, you know, your words on a page. You learn every single time, you learn something new, you learn what works for you and what hasn't, and you can kind of start to streamline that process. So now all the kind of the technical um, sort of aspects of kind of coming up with an idea and plotting and, and planning it and um, how I kind of structure my drafts and things like that. Like I know exactly how that works. So I can I can kind of, um, you know, I, yeah, I can kind of um, fast forward through that, you know, easy, much easier now than I could, you know, for the, absolutely for the dry and, and even for every book since it, it gets faster and faster and you can just get to the um, yeah, to the, the creative part and how you're going to, you know, execute this in the best possible way. So um, I think for sure, like, you know, you learn you learn more every time and I think that that's only, um, that absolutely benefits you. And you're known for being quite a disciplined writer. Um, you know, there are the, the writers of 100 years ago who would drink too much and write late into the night and their whole lives would fall apart and that was just part of the creative process not part of your process. It might be, but you don't talk about that publicly. Um, your process is very disciplined and you're known as, you know, sitting down at a desk and treating it like a job. Was your process with this book similar or has it evolved um, after writing the other the other three? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was um, it's, it's probably evolved, but in a, um, you know, even more kind of, um, you know, I guess disciplined way in that, um, you know, like I really do know how to make the best use of my time now. And I guess, you know, a lot of that, um, you know, the benefit um, for me of having worked as a, a print journalist for 13 years before I wrote The Dry really helped. I mean, I've sort of talked a lot about how the, um, you know, that gave me a lot of discipline and it, it sort of helped me learn how to kind of express myself clearly on a page and how to, um, I think, structure a story so that you you get the reader early and then you you have to keep them you have to kind of keep giving them those that kind of ebb and flow that that carries someone through there's no point having a great ending if you have like a real sunken like middle middle section and things so um i think all those things have, have really helped and i think um you know, with this book, I, I think particularly, like, I really did feel the benefit of having done the others. I mean, the the planning process for me this time, which, which always helps me, was um, was really, um, you know, I, I felt I had to go the really 
exactly how I, I kind of hoped it would. But having said that, though, I think because a lot of people do ask about, you know, my writing style and like how I do it and, you know, what my day looks like and things. And I think, you know, the thing I, I just also would like to say to people who are, um, you know, trying to write maybe their first novel is that I think, you know, honestly, like whatever works for you is the right way to do it. Like you don't you don't need to kind of be a slave to other people's ideas of how you should write a book because there's, there's so many, you know, writing books out there and so many authors willing to kind of give their advice. But it, it it's you you see yourself it's so conflicting and I think um, you can kind of tie yourself up in knots trying to do someone else's pattern. So I think whatever um, you know whatever works for you is the right way to do it. And the only sort of thing I would say is that I think um, just give yourself kind of the best chance you can by focusing on um, the things that will, will help you get those words on a page. So, you know, find, try and find some consistency um, to write, try and um, you know, find somewhere that you, you can focus and you have a bit of like literally the practical place, like where you sit down and, and write, you know, so you have, have a bit of headspace. Um, you know, a really like simple one, but honestly makes a huge difference is that I write down all my ideas. You know, there's a lot of people, um, well, authors, I guess, who, I've heard who, who say, you know, oh, like I remember the good ideas and things. And I'm sure, look, you know, maybe they do. I, I don't, you know, and I, and, I, and I often go back to my notes and um, the, the ideas that I've written down in the middle of the night or when I've been busy or at the supermarket, whatever, I honestly, I know I would have forgotten them and they absolutely make it into the book. So that is, in terms of the amount of effort that takes, which is zero, just write it down on your phone in the notes section, the rewards are like, a thousand times that so that is like a really you know things like that the really sort of small easy things you can do that that um can just make your life easier and free up your headspace so that you can whatever works for you you can do that the best you can yeah that's such a good tip i'm exactly the same i don't remember anything um that i don't write down uh i also know that a lot of people are keen to know what is happening with the dry. We heard that it is in production. Reese Witherspoon um, bought the rights to it, I believe, and Eric Banner's in it. What else can you tell us about what's happening when it's out? What can we expect? Yeah. So yeah. So the, the um, film adaptation of the Dry is really yeah, it's really exciting. It's great. So basically, um, we're actually um, nearly at the finish line with that. In that it's done. Like so, the movie's done. It was. It's filmed. It's finished. Um, I think it's penciled to be out in April next year. Um, so it's actually due to be out earlier, uh, a little a few months, ago, actually August this year. Um, and then um, it was delayed because of obviously the, um, you know, the pandemics. Um, so now it's out yeah, next year. And yeah, it's, it's, um, it's really exciting. So they filmed it um, in um, March last year, so March 2019, up in Northwest Victoria, in a lot of different kind of small town locations, uh, which is which is great. I was really happy about it because that was kind of the the region that the dry was was set in. Um, so th the setting I thought was really great, like, um, and it was really visually exactly how I kind of imagined the book to be. Um, then um, so I got to go up there and be an extra. And see, and see them filming, and so if you um, look out um, in the funeral and the wake scenes, you can see um, you have to look pretty fast. <laughs> but you can see me and about a dozen of my kind of family and friends, sort of, you know, playing grieving townspeople. So that was that was really that was really fun. That was a very surreal moment because um, it felt very real. You know, it was it was really beautifully done. Like it, it felt very authentic, and. Um, yeah, and and they got to kind of see how they were doing it. But it's, I think as an amateur, it's very hard to see to see a film set and imagine what that's going to translate to, you know, on screen because it, it all looks so different. For, you know, it, you, you don't you don't really know what you're looking at. Um, so I got to see the finished film though earlier this year, and it's it's um, superb. Honestly, it's so great. I really really loved it. And um, the director and screenwriter Robert Connolly did a really um, fantastic job of I thought capturing the real kind of the, the, the spirit and the feel of the book um the plot all the kind of key he hit all the kind of key notes I felt um Eric Banner was as perfect as you can imagine as Fork um all the cast I thought were really great they really sort of captured the characters like I loved it I I honestly like I'm so so happy with it so I think I think yeah readers will really love it and that was that was all I really hoped for it you know that 
people who like the book would would feel that the film had done it justice and I, I, I really completely has. Oh, I can't wait. I'm so, so excited. And I was reading The Survivors. I was seeing it in my head as a motion picture as well and working out who'd play who um, because that's how I read all your books now. Um, I did want to ask uh, before we get to some questions from um, the commenters, have you been reading much over lockdown? What have you been reading? What's sort of the best thing you've you've read this year? Yeah, so I have been, yeah, I have been a bit. I mean, because um, I'm based in Melbourne, so we've, we've got, you know, extra lockdown, so even more reading time. And um, so, yeah, so what have I um, been reading? So actually, I'll start actually with one, actually one book that I haven't read yet, but I'm, I'm looking forward to, which is um, by a guy called um, Jim McIntyre, who wrote a book called Nikolai the Perfect. Um, that's N-I-K-O-L-A-I, the perfect. And um, that actually came out on Monday this week. And um, I haven't actually got a copy yet because we're in lockdown, but um, I'm particularly interested to read that book because when, um, as many of you would know, The Dry won the unpublished um, yeah. manuscript edition in Victoria in 2016. And Jim McIntyre's book, Nikolai the Perfect, was a runner up that year. So, that, so the dry, it got beaten by the dry, um, and that uh, and Nikolai the Perfect, and another book called Fine by Michelle Wright, which is a collection of short stories, which is out um, currently, were the runners up that year. And um, I'm just, you know, there's this whole alternate universe of my life where I didn't win that competition, and who knows what would have happened. And I just, um, I really, you know, looking forward to reading Jim's book and seeing, you know, what he did. Um, so that's what I'm really looking forward to. Other ones I've read that I've really enjoyed. Um, uh, my, um, my good friend actually from the, my days at the um, newspaper, um, Karina Kilmore, um, has um, been shortlisted for a Ned Kelly Award with her debut novel, Where the Truth Lies. So I was really excited to see that. Um, the, and also I'm being interviewed by her actually in one of my other events um, next week. Um, Another person um, who I've really enjoyed has been Ben Stevenson, Benjamin Stevenson, he writes under, um, who wrote his second novel, which is called um, Either Side of Midnight. And that's a that's like a crime um, novel based around a character um, that appeared in his first um, book, which I also really enjoyed called Green Lights. And then also I've um, just finished reading um, Kate Milton Hall's book, um, The Mother Faults. Um, that's Kate not my guess. Should I read yeah, that? Well, you absolutely. Pick it up. You know, Kate, Kate um, and I are chatting again also um, in a couple of weeks, but um, I really enjoyed that one as well. And that was like, that was sort of quite different from the books I normally read. And I, but, you know, I thought like she's done a really um, amazing job with that. So all of those have, um, yeah, really enjoyed. And um, yeah, so that's kind of might be my, on my reading list lately. It's been an outstanding year in books, which has been the one silver lining of this year, I think, is that we can't get through our reading piles quick enough because there is just so much coming in and the survivors has been added to um a lot of people's piles although i'm sure it's gone straight to the top um let's take some questions from people i think we're going to have some pop up on the screen um i know there are a lot of people expressing their uh incredible excitement for the movie um what else have we got here? The other thing I was just gonna ask while we wait for a question to pop up is about your inspiration. Um, oh, will the survivors be a movie? Actually, that's a good that's a good question. Um, is that something that you kind of think about now when you're putting together the story? Um, so it's not something I think about. Um, actually, so I'll answer the, the, the question first. So the survivors, I've actually sold the rights to the, to the survivors um, already. So um, with a view to that being made into a TV series. Um, so that's really exciting. So it's still really early days. So, um, you know, watch the space for details as and when, you know, they're fit to emerge. But, um, you know, I feel really confident that it's in really great hands. You know, my book's like obviously really important to me. So, you know, I want to find you know, I'm not going to sell it unless I feel like it's a, the right home. Um, so, you know, um, for this off to come into pre-publication, and I think, you know, it's 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 really, really good opportunity for the book. So that's exciting. So, we'll, yeah, we'll see, um, yeah, more to come on that hopefully um, in the future. Um, but I think, you know, when I'm writing the books, you know, honestly, like writing a novel is such a 
it's such a like full on process. You know, you've got you've got juggling. I feel like I'm one of these people like juggling like 20 balls in the air at times. You know, you've got all these kind of things to sort of pull together and um all these different kind of aspects to kind of keep in your mind, which is why I write things down a lot. Um, but and and I think adding in the kind of um you know idea that you know it, this could also be ad adapted is this one layer too much you know <laughs> so and it's also you know it's not something you can ever bank on either i mean it just you know it, it, so I, I just focus like i literally just focus on the book that, and for me the book is enough like that's you know um that is why i write books i write books to write books and you know the the book is um as a finished product it's just something I want it to be the best, you know, the best version it can be and be something I can, I'm really proud of at the end. I think, though, that the pacing is so well formed, like it, it's so well done for television or for a film, which is what makes it, um, you know, uh, it's no wonder it's being picked up. Um, I was so stunned when I just, when I first found out that you weren't Australian, how do you inhabit Aussie landscapes so very well? I, that was one of my big questions too, Jane, because I didn't understand. I assumed that you'd grown up in the country and that you had a real taste for the, you know, Australian landscape, but um, you're originally from, from the UK. When did you move to Australia? Yeah, so I've lived out here twice, actually. So I lived out here from the UK and I lived out here from when I was um, uh, 8 to 14, then moved back to England and um, yeah, went to school and uni and got, worked with some newspapers. And then when I was 28, I moved back um, back to Australia. So um, so I've lived here twice. And I think, um, you know, there's a, uh, I mean, there's a few sort of things I think that play into kind of writing about the landscape. And one is that I, had, I did have the benefit of having kind of memories of Australia and then moved away and come back with sort of fresh eyes. And I think that maybe made me focus a little bit more on the details than I would than I otherwise would have if I'd sort of lived here my whole life. Um, and I think though, the thing is though, I think when you're um, writing a book, especially if you're going to write multiple books set in different locations, you know, you have to kind of learn, I suppose, to reflect the setting that you're writing about at that time. You know, it's all very well if you've sort of grown up in a small country town to write about a small country town, but can you then translate that into another setting or are you committed to writing about small country towns mm. for your entire career? And, you know, and maybe that's a bad thing. Maybe that's, you know, maybe that, that would suit, you know, your particular style of writing. But I think, um, you know, it's about, I guess, like picking those techniques that will help you in any in any kind of setting, you know, whether that be Australian or, um, you know, overseas or a different, you know, different parts of, you know, Australia. And um, a big, you know, there's a few different ways you can do that. So I think one is um, that I often come back to is really cherry picking the things that are quite specific to that region um, or setting. So, um, you know, things like, um, you know, the, um, I don't know. I guess. I guess the the things that make you feel like, yeah, you know, this is this is where we are. So I mean, it could be like the school systems or the um, the type of you know kind of like wildlife you see in the oceans or um, the I don't know the way people speak to each other or um, I mean, you know, the Lost Man in setting out back Queens is a really good example. I mean, things like how they get their food and how mm. they you know I mean how to educate their children. Um, what they do if they need help, you know, things like that are kind of, um, so you're trying to kind of pick, I guess, those different aspects of the settings um, that will make it different from just any other similar setting. Yeah. Um, we've got a question. How long did it take you to write The Survivors? That's a great question. When, like, from when you first had the idea to deliver the manuscript, how long are we talking? Um, so it would have been, um, it would have been probably, um, about 14 months, I guess, um, probably from like literally the very first, you know, germ of the idea through to kind of signing off on it. Um, and, um, I had a baby in the middle of that as well. So, um, was, <laughs> so, so I like to think I could have done it today i'm not sure how much time that took up like a bit you know? so, so, um, 
that's just a, that's a fair, that is not a fair 14 months. That is not <laughs> like a full-time 14 months writing a book. I imagine that there was, you gave birth to the baby and then you had to look after the baby for another day or two and then maybe you got back into it. But that is a, a relatively significant disruption to your routine. Could yeah. you write? Because I imagine that you're not sleeping and I have this dream. We have a, a joke at work about, you know, going on maternity leave and writing a book and everyone laughs at us because they just say that's, you don't know what maternity leave is. Um, yeah. But how do you write when you're that tired and and uh, I imagine distracted? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I sort of I sort of try and um, uh, you know, I kind of try to like work the, the the sort of various deadlines. You know, so you have kind of times where you su you submit the book and then there's a bit of a natural lull. Mm -hmm. So I, I I gave birth during one of those natural lulls, you know, and then um and then I kind of get back into it. But um I think. You know, I think actually, um, so look, I did, yeah, I, I took sort of months, you know, a few months off while, you know, while he was really young. Um, but I think actually, you know, it's a, it's a good point. I know that I, I don't, it doesn't actually often come up in conversation, but I think I will make this point now. And that is that I do get a lot of comments from women, particularly on my um, social media pages and things, basically saying like, um, how do you do it? So, you know, and they, I can tell, I can tell from their profiles because they have young kids themselves. And, um, and what I would like to really say to you is like I like I don't I don't actually do it. I don't do it in the way that you think I do. So I think people have this perception that I um, you know, kind of get up and I, I wave my husband off to work and then while the kid's kind of napping, I sit down at the laptop and dash off a few chapters and then, you know, I'm kind of um, doing it while I'm being like a full time mother. And I just would like to say that that's not what happens. What happens is my husband looks after our children essentially full time while I write. And I, I, you know, get waved off. And I go to my office alone and I sit there alone in complete quiet. And, you know, and I sit there and I focus and I do my you know, however many hours I need to do, and I do that as many days of the week as I need to do to hit the deadline, um, and and that's what happens. So I'm not doing this in my spare time. This is like my full time job and family business, and that's how we structure it. Yeah, I remember reading one a statistic that said that I think the most productive people in the workplace are working mums because they do not waste 30 seconds, <laughs> which I think is um, is very true. It's definitely something that I have noticed. Um, we might just take one more question. Will you write a novel with a female protagonist? Yeah, look, I think I absolutely would. I think, you know, um, and I'm sure I will actually. Um, I think it's just, um, it is that case of finding the right characters for the right story. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, when I'm sort of planning, like I, I try out like lots of different things. And that's part of the reason why I do plan a lot is because it allows me to try out things um, without wasting 20,000 words on it and then realizing it's the wrong direction. So I can, you know, I can, I can try it out in a plan with 200 words and see if it, you know, if it's going to gel or not. So um, yeah, it's something I always kind of consider like really carefully. And um, yeah, I think, you know, absolutely. When the right sort of story comes along that presents itself, that will become really clear to me. And that's that's what I'll do. And I'm interested, are you, um, oh, we've got another one. What draws you to the crime genre? Have you experimented with other genres? Um, so what draws me to it is, I guess, I, I try and write books that I think I would like to read. So, um, you know, I, I do like books with, um, so, so, I mean, crime is like a really broad spectrum. You know, you can get crime books really, you know, you can get really dark to real, you know, lights, you know, there's, and everything in between. Um, and so I sort of pitch my books where I feel comfortable and what I like to, to read. So I like, you know, a bit of mystery and suspense, a bit of light and dark. I like characters that feel authentic and have, you know, I feel like real believable kind of conversations and relationships. And I like um, a book that um, resolves itself well at the end. So that's what I'm kind of always sort of aiming for. You know, and, and that's what I try and write. Um, and I haven't, um, you know, I haven't experimented with any other genres only because I've never written any other books, you know. Like I sort of, um, I, I just sort of write, um, you know, I've, I've only ever written these four books and um, you all know what they are, I guess. Um, but I think, I don't know. I mean, I do sometimes think about 
you know, ideas for stories that wouldn't wouldn't fit into this this kind of um, genre. So, uh, you know, whether I'd ever sort of pursue that or not. So I think it, that would have to be a bit of a side project and um, whether I'd sort of ever find a time or motivation to kind of see if that works or not. But, um, you know, never say never. I mean, if I have a had a really great idea and um, felt it was worth following through, you know, then, yeah, I'd absolutely maybe try that one out. Why do you think we are so obsessed with crime? I mean, as a culture, it seems like we've never been so obsessed with with true crime but also crime fiction and that appears to you know as a genre be skyrocketing um which you're now very much a, a kind of leader in that um that genre why do you think we're we're so obsessed yeah i mean i guess um you know i think it depends a bit what you want from your you know, sort of forms of entertainment, I suppose. I mean, some people do really like that, that kind of the true crime stuff and the podcasts and things. That seems to be having a real, you know, a real moment. Um, but I think, you know, I feel like people have always really enjoyed a good mystery. I mean, people always like being surprised, don't they? And and they like sort of having that kind of moment where, you know, you're like, ah, oh, okay, so that's so that's what happened. And I think I think that's always been something that that readers have enjoyed, and maybe it's just sort of manifesting itself in slightly different ways with the types of books that are coming out now. But um, yeah, I mean, that, I guess that's what draws me to it, anyway. Yeah, it's it's as though I mean, we're, when we read books and and you know when you write, it's so much about stakes, and I just think the stakes are never higher than when it's life and death, which seems to be that captures our attention more than anything anything else and that is quite ubiquitous but then it's also having this moment um because we're consuming so much content um at the moment in all sorts of mediums do you have another project on on the go or do you have a break now so i think um i um i always kind of have one eye on you know the next um you know like we've got coming next really and i think um for me um, you know, I, I get the, um, I've got like quite a lot of commitments around the survivors. So I'll, um, I'll kind of enjoy the release and, um, you know, do my events and, and, you know, do virtual events like this one, which is really great to have this kind of opportunity. And then, um, as soon as I, um, start turning my, you know, um, to the next book, which I think is still, you know, I'm still concerned to that. Um, it would be in a similar sort of tone and feel to um, the previous four. Um, you know, I like to kind of toss up a few ideas and really sort of see what what settles and give, you know, give the best ideas a chance to rise to the surface so that, um, you know, rather than just like launch in, I like to kind of, um, yeah, just make sure I'm like really sort of comfortable and following the right path. So, um, yeah, I'll have a, quite a lot of thinking time um, and then I'll sort of get into it. Oh, good. All right. Well, we've got more to come then. I think we've got a few more questions. Um, lots coming through. Um, what have we got? There was one just popping up before. While we wait for that, um, I just wanted to ask what your sort of the authors that you read and the work you read, what inspires your writing? Like what, what do you think has in, inspired your tone and your approach? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, lots of different, um, you know, you get lots of different things from different books. And um, when I read a book that I really enjoy, I like to kind of try and work out why it is that that book has worked on me. Um, you know, and so, um, you know, things like, you know, I, like I've, I've you know, said before quite a lot, like I really enjoy like Lee Child, you know, his Jack Reacher mm -hmm. series. Um, and, you know, one of the things I think is really great about that is a kind of the pacing and that kind of real cliffhanger sort of chapter endings that, that he manages to do really well. So, um, you, you know, I sort of, I'm always kind of reading a little bit with one eye on the, um, you know, on, on the, the technique, I guess. Yeah. Um, but I think also, you know, a, a lot of other books, like non-crime books, I really like um, the kind of the the relationships and things. So I guess in the stuff is a bit more, um, I don't know, would be, I suppose, classes like, you know, women's fiction or, um, you know, kind of um, romantic comedy and things. Like I do think often um, really have like really beautiful relationships between the characters, like friendships and family relationships. And um, I think that's something there's like a lot to be learned from the way 
that kind of um, internal domestic drama plays out. So I think you can get a lot. And even if you, know, you read a book on a city you don't like, and you you know it's worth sort of trying to work out, I guess, why it's not worth as well. You know, maybe what what could have been done differently to sort of um, make it work. So I'm always kind of it's a bit annoying actually. I do tend to assess quite a lot when I read. <laughs> It doesn't sound like you're getting completely immersed in the book, um, but I can understand that would be difficult to switch off. Any more fork stories, Julian asks? Yeah, look, I think I think for sure. I think I would definitely, um, I'm definitely still considering like, um, you know, um, come, you know, come back to him in, in what form really, because, you know, I mean, Fork and I owe him a lot really. Like he sort of, he launched my career and, you know, um, and we we're about to see him on a big screen in the dry, you know, so um, I think um, it would be a bit of a shame to sort of um, never, you know, never revisit him again. Um, it's just, um, it really is about finding that, that right story because often like the way I kind of write the books, I do tend to, to fit the characters around a plot rather than the other way around. So, yeah. you know, I, I will choose the best characters that, that can tell you know, that story. And, you know, for the last two particularly, that was a really, it was really clear to me really early on, they were standalones. Um, so it's about finding, you know, that, that, that story is really going to give him like a great vehicle and a really good kind of opportunity to shine. Mm, yeah. And oh, last question. And now that we know he looks like Eric Banner, I think that makes it even better, is that, like, we've got such a clear picture. <laughs> How important is the first sentence? Do you agonise over it? I love this question. Yeah, that's like, a good question. Yeah. Um, you just sit down and go, I need to write a New York Times bestseller. What's the first couple of words of this? Where do I start? Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I do, yeah, I think the first sentence is really important. Um, and I do, I'm not sure agonise is quite the right word, but I'd spent a lot of time thinking about it. But not, but I was, I was just not at the start though. So I don't sit down when I'm thinking about a book. Again, if you're going to write your debut novel, um, you know, I wouldn't advise you sitting down at your laptop and thinking and looking at a blank page and thinking, got to get this killer opening. Um, I, th I think a lot about the first sentence, but I think about that like actually quite lace. Um, so I would, you know, I would probably really have like, a, I would have like at least like a full draft completed before I would really finalize that mm. that first sentence. And then and then really all the sentences that follow, you know, you've got to kind of have one good sentence, you've got to have a few, you know. Um, and, um, and even then, sometimes then, you know, you'll kind of go through the editing process and you'll actually, um, maybe have a better idea for the opening. So you'll, you know, change it completely. And um, so I'm always, you know, by the end, I'm always I'm always completely happy with how it opens. And I always do usually have like kind of the, you know, the, the opening in mind, um, you know, early on. Um, but, you know, it is really important to get the reader in. So I spent quite a lot of time workshopping that. Yeah, for um, the survivors landed on my desk at work and myself and a friend were fighting over who got to read it first, got quite heated, and she said to me, just read me the first sentence, read me the first sentence. And so I read it out loud and we just both gasped. So for anyone who hasn't read it yet, who hasn't bought it yet, you must. It'll have you in from the very first sentence like all of Jane's books. You can buy it via, there's a link in the comments below, you can buy it at your local Dimmix or via Dimmix online. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you Jane for your time tonight. Thank you Jesse. thank you so much. It's been a really fun chat and I'm looking forward to reading your book next year when it comes out. Good luck with that. I, I know we spoke about it last time when we met so um, I'm really pleased for you that it's coming out. I look forward to reading it. We did. If there's anyone in the comments who wants to write their own book, may I just recommend Jane's TED Talk. She got me through it. She was my um, my mentor from a distance. Um, I, I watch that a lot and you can learn a lot by reading Jane's work. So um, that is my recommendation. But thank you so much for joining us and uh, get your hands on a copy. It is brilliant. Everyone's going to be talking about it. Have a great rest of your night. See ya. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.